26, Sins and Conscience. We have been sacrificed through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Hebrews 10 verse 10. It is because of his work on the cross that our conscience is at peace despite indwelling sin. Once we know our conscience to be purged concerning the ever-present principle of sin, we can rest in our Father's gracious provision for the sins we commit, but not until then. The fact of sin within can in no way keep us from resting and rejoicing in our risen Lord, abiding in the very presence of the Father. He himself, after condemning sin in the flesh, raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2 verse 6. First, we look at the Advocate. When we are at rest concerning sin, through abiding in the risen Lord, we are established and ready to receive his answer to the problem of sins committed. There are two factors that come into play when we've sinned. First, Christ's advocacy, that's this chapter. And then our confession, the next chapter. His advocacy is the foundation for our confession. 1 John 2, 1 says, My little children, these things I write unto you, that you sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. An advocate is one who speaks in support of another. Our Lord Jesus has entered heaven, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Hebrews 9, 24. As our high priest, he is in God's presence on our behalf. He is there as our propitiation, our atonement. Hebrews 10 verse 12 says this, But this man, after he had offered once sacrifice for sins, forever sat down on the right hand of God. He is seated because as far as our acceptance and position before God are concerned, there is nothing more required either to do or to say. By his own blood he entered once into the holy place having obtained eternal redemption for us. Hebrews 9 verse 12. As our advocate, the Lord Jesus is before the Father, maintaining us in fellowship with him. There in our position we are perfected forever. Hebrews 10 14. Here in our condition, indwelt by the principle of sin, we are often overcome by its power. Nevertheless, by the ministry of the Spirit, our condition is being perfected or matured. When we sin in word or thought or deed, consciously or unconsciously, our Heavenly Advocate speaks to the Father on our behalf. His faithful intercession is justly founded on his perfect work and person, and thereby our right of position in the Father's presence is forever maintained. Although our sins are never imputed to us, they do defile us and hinder our fellowship with the Father. Even though God justly and fully accepts the atonement of his Son on our behalf, he in no way passes over or tolerates our sins. He has not only provided his Son as our Saviour, but also as our Advocate. If any man sin, we have an Advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. 1 John 2 verse 1. Further, he has given us the responsibility and privilege of confessing our sins. He that is washed, that's atonement, he that is washed need not save to wash but his feet, that's confession. John 13 verse 10. For, as 1 John 1 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Not only do we have an advocate in heaven before the Father, but we also have an advocate with our spirit. The word comforter in John 14 verse 16 is rendered advocate in 1 John 2 verse 1. We need and have a dual advocacy. When we sin, 
Jesus intercedes for us on the grounds of his having borne the judgment of that very sin. The indwelling spirit acts on our conscience to produce confession. Therefore we have the assurance of the sin having been forgiven, the unrighteousness cleansed, and our fellowship with the Father completely restored. So too the Holy Spirit comes to our aid and bears us up in our weakness, for we do not know what prayer to offer, nor how to offer it worthily, as we ought, but the Spirit himself goes to meet our supplication and pleads on our behalf with unspeakable yearnings and groanings too deep for utterance. And he who searches the hearts of men knows what is in the mind of the Holy Spirit, what his intent is, because the Holy Spirit intercedes and pleads before God in behalf of the saints according to and in harmony with God's will. Romans 8, verses 26 and 27. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Psalm 23, verse 3. The fact that we need constant advocacy before the Father in no way detracts from the truth of our perfect and eternal standing in the Lord Jesus. The word makes it clear that each of us at the moment of our new birth is fully accepted in the beloved. We are complete in him, perfectly and forever forgiven, justified, sanctified and glorified through his death, resurrection and ascension. Never to come into judgment, but have passed from death to life as new creations in Christ Jesus. Before God, we are not in the flesh, the fallen first Adam race, but in the spirit, the new last Adam race, having died unto sin, self, Satan, the law and the world, we are now forever alive in our risen Lord, after the power of an endless life. Hebrews 7 verse 16. Next we look at our condition. Although we are not in the flesh as to our position, we are in the body pertaining to our condition. While we are completing Christ who is our life, as new creations in him, we have to be matured in the midst of the pressures of everyday experiences. Moreover, all is carried on in the body of death, which is indwelt by the principle of sin. Therefore, we need the two faithful advocates who undertake to fulfil God's purpose in and through us, despite the power of the world and the flesh and the devil. The negative and positive aspects of our spiritual growth could be summarised in these words. First, we are to consider ourselves to have died to sin, thus giving the Holy Spirit freedom to apply the finished work of the cross to indwelling sin, so that it may be progressively held inoperative. And second, at the same time, we are to consider ourselves as new creations, alive to God in Christ Jesus, abiding in him as a branch in the true vine. Oh, praise the Lord, that if and when we do sin in thought, in word or in deed, consciously or otherwise, we do have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. 1 John 2 verses 1 and 2. His advocacy has nothing whatsoever to do with our eternal standing, nor is it the placating of an angry and vengeful God. He has already bore the wrath due to our sin. But in his personal reconciliation on the cross and righteous presence before God, he makes it possible for our Father justly to show us mercy despite our sins. The chasm between our present position and our imperfect condition is bridged by his advocacy and cleansing. Our only source of life and growth is in Christ. From that completed source, 
our condition is gradually developed. Our progress on earth is dependent on our fellowship with him in heaven. Because of sins committed, that fellowship must be restored by Christ's advocacy and our confession. As we mature spiritually, there are fewer sins to be confessed. How futile to seek to deal with sins in any other way than through his advocacy and our confession. There are those who for one reason or another bypass the identification truths of Romans 6 and rely rather on the confession and cleansing for dealing with the problem of sin. But there is no real spiritual progress unless the source of sin is dealt with continually by the Spirit's application of the cross. He carries on that ministry as we consider self having been crucified. Apart from this, there is nothing but the endless struggle of the treadmill, sinning, repenting, confessing, but then sinning again and again. On this erroneous basis, there is no dealing with the source that relentlessly produces the sins. Rather, we are to learn to rely on the cross to deal with the sin principle as we abide in the risen Lord for our spiritual growth. Then, if we do sin, we depend on our advocate in heaven to re-establish our fellowship with the Father and our advocate within to repair the spiritual damage by means of conviction, leading us to repentance and confession. While living in this world, it's heartening to realise that we neither have to ask nor plead for his intercession. Both our advocates are unceasingly interceding for us. We read in Hebrews 7, 25, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing that he ever liveth to make intercession for them. The fact that we commit sins despite such faithful ministry doesn't reflect on the worth or effectiveness of the intercession. It reflects on our faithfulness. We fail to count on our death to sin and our life in Christ. If it were not for the constant intercession of our heavenly advocate, our faith would surely fail when we are overcome or when we willingly submit to the tyranny of sin and self. Think what happened when Simon Peter denied his Lord. Our Lord Jesus said in Luke 22, verses 31 and 32, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, restored, strengthen thy brethren, the Lord Jesus did not pray that Peter might not sin, but that having fallen, that his faith would respond to his Lord's advocacy. His faithful intercession kept Peter from self-centred despair, giving him grace for true repentance, deep sorrow for his sin, purity of conscience and restoration of fellowship. And lastly, we look at position here. At rest in our position in the Lord Jesus, we can depend upon the Holy Spirit to take us through all that is required for our growth in the purpose of God. Inasmuch then as we have in Jesus, the Son of God, a great high priest who has passed into heaven itself, let us hold firmly to our profession, to our confession of faith. For we have not a high priest who is unable to feel for us in our weaknesses, but one who was tempted in every respect, just as we are tempted, and yet he didn't sin. Therefore let us come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our times of need. Hebrews 4, verses 14 to 16. We must face the fact that there is going to be constant need, even as we are most fully learning to hate and reject self and love the Lord Jesus in that God is just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus, as we read in Romans 3.26, he is free to utilise even our failures as he develops our condition. 
all things work together for good to them that love God. Romans 8, 28. In all that we go through, we are taught more fully to reject self via the cross and to abide in Christ via our position. At the same time, we are to count more on his advocacy and, and rejoice in the privilege of our fellowship with the Father. Moreover, we thus become better fitted to understand and minister to our weaker brethren, knowing full well what they are going through. When thou art converted, when thou art restored, strengthen thy brethren. Luke 22 verse 32. If we turn our position of rest to fight against sin and work to improve our condition, we have stepped off the rock of grace and into the swamp of self-effort. But as we turn from self to abide in our Lord at the right hand of the Father, we find that he has dealt with both the principle of sin and our sins. We can rest in the fact that his work of atonement is never repeated, as his word assures us. As we read in Hebrews 10, 17, And their sins and offences I will remember no longer. But when these have been forgiven, no further offering for sin is required. We depend on the fact that his work as advocate is never interrupted, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Hebrews 7, 25. Since, therefore, brethren, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. Hebrews 10 verses 19 to 22. 27. Sins and Light But if we really are living and walking in the light as he himself is in the light, we have true, unbroken fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses and removes us from all sin and guilt. 1 John 1, 7. What is this light in which we have been placed, in which we are to walk? And this is the message which we have heard from him and now are reporting to you that God is light and there is no darkness in him at all. No, not in any way. 1 John 1, 5. Since our Father is light, our Lord Jesus is light also. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6. While here on earth, the Lord Jesus said, I am the light of the world. John 8 verse 12. Nevertheless, the full extent of that light was kept almost totally obscured by his humanity. For a brief moment, while on the Mount of Transfiguration, he allowed the true light within to be manifested. And he was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Matthew 7 verse 2. Peter wrote later that he and others were eyewitnesses of his majesty in 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 16. At present our Lord Jesus is in glory on the right hand of the majesty on high, as we read in Hebrews 1 verse 3. It is in his light that we are to abide and to walk. For now ye are light in the Lord, so walk as children of light. Ephesians 3 verse 8. Every Christian is positionally in the light, but until he learns to abide and walk in that light, he can only struggle on in the darkness of sin and self. We read in Ephesians, For once you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. 
for the fruit, the effects, the product of the light, consists in every form of kindly goodness, uprightness of heart and trueness of life. Ephesians 5 verses 8 and 9. Our blood-brought position is in the light of our Father's presence. First, we look at condition. The healthy babe in Christ begins well, whether or not he knows anything at all concerning his position in the light. Being a child, spiritually, he's handled as such by the Father. He feels that the Lord Jesus is very close to him and is leading him by the hand. He's filled with the joy of the Lord and loves him with all his heart. Although he's looking to the Lord Jesus, he is still self-centred though because of ignorance regarding his position in him. He is taken up mainly with what Christ has done, what Christ is doing and what Christ will do for him. He is in turn seeking to live and to work for the Lord. For the most part, he's emotionally motivated and therefore affected by his condition rather than his position. Later during the believer's spiritual adolescence, the Lord begins his reversal of all of this. The emphasis in the life is to be shifted from dwelling on what Jesus has done to rejoicing in who, what and where he is. From being happy and active to being like him. From living and working for Christ to living in and working through him. From what the believer is in himself to what he is in Christ and what he is in the believer. From condition to position. In other words, not I, but Christ. Of necessity, the transitional process from a condition-centred to a position-centred life is extremely painful. Now, no chastening or child training for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, Afterwards it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Hebrews 12 verse 11. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Hebrews 12 verse 6. In spite of the believer's good position and in the midst of his joy and activity for the Lord, self begins to creep back into the picture. The indwelling principle of sin once more asserts its tyrannical power and the world regains its attractiveness. Peace and love tend to weaken and drain away. The quiet time quietly dies. Study of the word becomes burdensome, a burdensome work. The conscience is defiled. Sins are no longer confessed but excused. The eyes are off the Lord, the struggle with self is on, simply because condition has given precedence over position. Now the faltering believer becomes keenly aware of self and only vaguely aware of the son. Desperately upset about his falling and failing condition, he struggles to improve himself and all the while begging God to give him some relief and some victory. This is the vantage point that Satan has been waiting for. He slyly leads the believer to compare the present condition with the happy carefree days gone by and to question every realm of belief, thus shaking all reliance on the word of God and on the Lord. He ruthlessly puts the wavering Christian on the defensive in every aspect of his life and his walk. He applies downward pressure and fills the heart with the gnawing remorse of self-condemnation. When the believer allows the enemy to spread the choking smog of self-accusation over his life, the realisation of his righteousness in Christ is dimmed. The goal of Satan is to lure the believer back into the ground of condemnation in order to negate the benefits of the resurrection with Christ and his union with him in the heavenlies. Those who are not established by the no condemnation ground of Romans chapter 8 verse 1 make very little spiritual progress. 
They go just so far and then bog down. Their fruit falls before it ripens. But the destroying power of the enemy is rendered null and void when the believer rests in the truth. The truth that the Lord of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Romans 8 verse 2. Although the Holy Spirit as convictor pulls the heart in an agony of conviction of sins, he never points downward. While Satan's accusation results in self-consciousness, Holy Spirit conviction leads to Christ consciousness. When he convicts the heart and conscience concerning sins, he leads the believer to the self-judgment of confession. He then points upward to the remedy of sins committed, the blood, the blood that has opened the way to the peace and life of our position in the light of God's presence. Hebrews 10, 19 writes this, having therefore brethren boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. The enemy spurs the falling one to self-effort by holding the impossible standard of perfection over the very imperfect believer's head. He agitates continually for immediate and complete rectification of the failing condition. But the patient Holy Spirit, on the other hand, allows time for development, graciously reminding of the ever available and finished work of the shed blood for our cleansing from all unrighteousness through the process of growth. He leads the faltering believer from self-centeredness and darkness to Christ-centeredness and light. To bring this about, the spirit of truth presents positional truths, such as Colossians 3 verse 1. If or since ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. And Colossians 3 verse 3, For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So now we look at the position. The awakened Christian who is not resting in his position becomes discouraged by his condition. Therefore confession of his sins is sporadic. And he has little or no assurance of being cleansed from all unrighteousness. He's out of fellowship with the Father and the Son and finds himself convicted by the Holy Spirit, whom he is grieving. He's also under the domination of sin and self, as well as the condemnation of the devil. Oh, he is utterly wretched, with his sins accumulated as a cloud, obscuring the light of his position of freedom and fellowship in his risen Lord. But it is the history of Satan always to overstep himself. His most apparent victories all contain the seed of his own defeat. The very need generated by the believer's failure is the Spirit's preparation for his seeing and abiding in his blessed position of light. The faith is to be focused on the fact that God has already given him a position in his presence. What is more, he has already established himself in that position. We read in Isaiah 44, 22, I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions and as a cloud thy sins. Return to me, for I have redeemed thee. The honest but still self-centred believer is oppressed and hindered by the darkness of his sinful condition. Nevertheless, in the midst of his downward trend, the Holy Spirit is presenting the truth so as to overwhelm him by the light of his righteous position. John 8.32 says, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Not only is he free from the penalty of sin, but also from its power to bring forth sins. 
the believer is bound until, in spite of his sins, he rests in the truth concerning those sins. What then is the specific truth concerning our sins? In our condition, we're totally unacceptable for the Father's presence and fellowship. But position is what counts with God, and it must come first with us. We read the following in Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 to 14. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, or has made us suitable to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us in and through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And in 1 John 1, 7, we read that the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Every believer, regardless of his present condition, is in the very presence of the Father. We are in Christ. We are at the right hand of the majesty on high. The source of our Christian life is in the light above, in Christ risen. It is there that we are able to abide. It is that complete standing which alone will affect the growth of our daily state. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Colossians 1, 20 to 22. We are not to be influenced by our feelings and our condition, but rather by his written word. In spiritual growth, the eye of faith is slowly transferred from our own point of view to his point of view, from condition to position. By means of intelligent faith in the scriptural facts, we are to turn boldly from sinful darkness to rest in his holy light. We read in Psalm 119, verse 130, that the entrance of thy words giveth light. And in Ephesians 2, 13 and 14, we read the following. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes far off are made nigh, reconciled to his presence by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, we read the following. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Since we are born into Christ, who is our righteousness, our Father is able to accept us fully into his presence, just as we are. Our right to the light is our eternal position, in spite of our present condition. Our walk is the result of the source of our life. If we attempt to walk as Christians in dependence on our own resources, there is self-centeredness, self-righteousness and darkness. And when we walk in dependence on the source of our life, the Lord Jesus, in the light of God's presence, there is Christ-centeredness, his righteousness. And the Lord shall be thine everlasting light. Isaiah 60 verse 20. In our estimation, which is looming larger? Our sins or his blood shed for those sins? Are we viewing our sins from his side or from ours? Are we letting God be God in this matter? It is for us to think God's thoughts after him. He has graciously and justly placed us in his Son, the very light of earth and heaven, 
Can our sins come between our Father and his glorified Son who is in our life? Never! He has borne them in all his own body on the tree. He is our risen advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous. By means of his atoning blood, he maintains eternally our relationship with the Father in unbroken integrity. Though our sins can in no way affect our position in the light or alter his thoughts of love towards us, they can and they do affect our thoughts and our attitudes towards our Father. They can never cloud his view of our advocate, but they can and they do obliterate our vision of his advocacy. They immediately hinder our communion and fellowship with the Father and the Son. The dark cloud of guilt and conviction of sin settles down on the heart and conscience unless we learn to judge ourselves and willingly confess our sins before God. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 31 28. Sins and Confession If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1 9 God the Father is free to forgive our sins because the Lord Jesus has already dealt with their source, the principle of sin. He condemned it in his flesh on the cross. Romans 8 verse 3 Confessing our sins, therefore, has nothing to do with condemnation, but with cleansing and communion. First, we look at condition. The believer who is not aware of his perfect position before God, who doesn't realise that the Father has already placed him in the light of his presence, is more aware of his self-centred condition than his Christ-centred position. Hence, he doesn't actually accept the benefit of his position in the light when he does confess his sins. He doesn't feel forgiven and cleansed of all unrighteousness. And soon he gives up confessing. Therefore, he flounders in darkness and guilt. This is the predicament of all too many believers today. In the early days of their Christian life, most believers are quite faithful in confessing their sins to the Father but because they are yet babes, there is very little scriptural knowledge of what God has done about the indwelling source of those sins. And before long, there are more sins committed than there are confessed sins. This accumulation of unconfessed sins brings guilt to the conscience, and the believer finds himself out of fellowship with the Father. Not only that, but he is experiencing chastisement. And to make matters worse, he now seeks to hide from the light. He forgets that the purpose of the light is not to punish or condemn the sinner, but to reveal sins so that they may be confessed and freely forgiven. Another common error is that of praying for forgiveness instead of heeding the word, the word of God, which says we must confess the sins and receiving the assurance of forgiveness. We may pray for forgiveness for months and still not receive the assurance of it. Many admit sin in general instead of confessing sins in particular. Assurance of forgiveness and cleansing are the sure result of honest and specific confession of sins committed in thought, word and deed. There may be repentance and brokenness, but this is the result of confession and cleansing, not the cause. If any man sin, there is the immediate recourse to confession and to Christ's advocacy and shed blood for complete forgiveness and cleansing. Read it again. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and so on. 1 John 1 9. So now we look at position. When we rest in our position in Christ, we find that we're in the light. We know that our sins have been purged once for all and therefore our conscience is cleansed. At the same time, we're very much aware that although we abide in the risen Lord Jesus, 
Our everyday Christian life is carried on in a sinful world. There are sins committed as we grow because we take our eyes off the Lord Jesus and foolishly rely on self. A defiled conscience and broken fellowship is the result. We also know that the remedy is to confess our sins, thereby to receive cleansing from all unrighteousness and restoration of a clear conscience and blessed fellowship. Our present experience is greatly inferior to our eternal position, no matter what the stage of our spiritual growth. The development of our condition is toward our finished position and at the same time from the completed source. The discrepancy between our position and our condition, manifested by our failures in growth and service, is justly taken care of by means of our confession and his cleansing. Our need is further met by Christ's faithful advocacy, whereby our position and fellowship are maintained throughout the progress of our spiritual growth. By these means, our Lord ever keeps us dependent on himself and at the same time fully confident in him, needy but bold. Abiding and walking in the light keeps us honestly aware of our sins while also enhancing our appreciation of his grace. The realisation of our sins doesn't cripple us because his cleansing frees us. The light that reveals our sins manifests the sun, enabling us honestly to face both without fear. Where we are most detected, there we are most protected. On this basis, the sins that are committed are immediately dealt with and we are able to continue in fellowship and in growth. The only alternative is self-confidently to struggle with sin and to fail and thereby to be hindered in our development. Our Father's counteraction is the ministry of the indwelling spirit of life. To have our sins so freely forgiven does not make us lax as to our walk. For one thing, with the forgiveness there is often his faithful chastisement. A good conscience is cherished too much for it to be lost by licence. We admit that we often stumble and fall and offend in many things, James 3 verse 2. But there need be no fear of facing up to each offence and confessing it. The light that reveals our sins ever reveals our perfect position in the Lord Jesus. For us, the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. 1 John 2 verse 8. Confession and cleansing enable us to rest before God without guile. Our attitude becomes, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there's any wicked way in me. Psalm 139 verses 23 and 24. There's no pretension of being without sins. Rather, we want them clearly revealed so that they may be confessed and thereby kept from breaking our all-important fellowship with the Father. We are faithfully taught the lesson not to attempt to hide our sins and refrain from confession. We read in Psalm 32 verses 3 and 4, When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groanings all day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. Guilt and chastisement do their thorough work and we learn to appreciate the fact that God's way of confession is imperative. All because of our position in the Lord Jesus and in spite of our condition in ourselves, our Father is able to say to us, For I know the thoughts I think towards you, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Jeremiah 29 verse 11. And in Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2, we read these words. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man upon whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, 
by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Romans 5 verses 1 and 2. As we grow, we learn to stand in our standing of grace, abiding in the risen Lord Jesus and walking in the light of the Father's presence and fellowship. We appreciate the fact of our position as we experience failures in fighting against sins. We express our growing hatred of self by freely confessing our sins, which amounts to judging ourselves for submitting to indwelling sin. We admit our responsibility for walking or, or drifting beyond the realm of light into the shadows of sin and self. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. For when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, and we should not be condemned with the world. Standing in the light, we are not only aware that our sins have been cleared away by the blood, but we realise that we, as sinners, have also been put away by death of the cross. We count ourselves to have died to sin, and now to be alive as new creations in Christ Jesus. As such, we confess our sins as they are revealed in the light, and we are therefore made free from self-occupation, free to be fully occupied in fellowship with the Father and the Son. To turn from the darkness and death of self to the light and life of Christ isn't to give up the fight and to give in to sin. No, not at all. It is fighting the good fight of faith, 1 Timothy 6.12. It is entering into the benefits of the fact that the fight has already been fought and won for us by another, by the Lord Jesus. This transition from bondage and defeat to freedom and victory is the faith move from the condition to the position. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. Hebrews 4 verse 10. The Holy Spirit brings us through this transition by a very simple process. He allows us to struggle with sin and self until we learn the futility of it. Then it is as he shows us that the Lord Jesus has already done for us what we could never do. It goes from, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? To, I thank God, he has already accomplished it through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 7, verses 24 and 25. It is from the bondage of the Lord in my members warring against the Lord of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the Lord of sin which is in my members to the liberty of the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, which has made me free from the law of sin and death. Romans 7 verses 23 and chapter 8 verse 2. And so this brings us to fellowship. God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 9. The root word for fellowship and communion is common. Our communion with the Father and the Son, having fellowship one with another, is to have common thoughts, common affections, a common purpose. It's a oneness of heart and a oneness of mind. It is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy mind. Luke 10, 27. As we study his word in dependence on his spirit, we're in communion with his thoughts. As we love the Lord Jesus, we are loving the one whom the Father loves with all his heart. Free from self-condemnation, free from a guilty conscience, free in the faithful advocacy of the Lord Jesus Christ, free in the confession of our sins and cleansing from all unrighteousness, we are in the light of his presence to worship him, to commune with him and to grow in him.
But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord, 2 Corinthians 3, 18. It is the look that justifies, but it is the gaze that sanctifies. Having died in Christ to sin, to Satan, to the law and to the world, we are free and born anew. We are made new creations in the Lord Jesus. Abiding in him in the light of the Father, we are at liberty to gaze on him in the full love of hearts and minds that are free from the appalling darkness of unconfessed sin and a defiled conscience. No nervous, anxious or restless self-effort, just quiet rest in him, knowing that our life is hid with Christ in God. Colossians 3 verse 3 By the ministry of the Spirit of Christ within, the life of the Lord Jesus is manifested increasingly in our everyday walk. Our Father's purpose for us is that we become conformed to the image or the character of his Son. To that end, all things are being worked together for good. Romans 8, 28 and 29. In our position in Christ, our Father has already perfected us, made us complete in him. In our walk, he by his Spirit is fashioning us after that blessed pattern that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. 2 Corinthians 4, 11. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. 1 John 2, verse 6. In the first place, the Lord Jesus walked in the light. He walked in fellowship with the Father. We read in John 3, verse 13, that the Son of Man, which is in heaven, Secondly, he walked in full dependence on the Holy Spirit. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness, Matthew 4 verse 1, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, Hebrews 9 verse 14. Likewise, our life is hid with Christ in God, and we walk in the light of God's presence during our earthly course. Our dependence is expressed as we walk in the Spirit, that we may not fulfil the lusts of the flesh. Galatians 5.16 We are to worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Philippians 3 verse 3 One of the Father's means of teaching us the Spirit-dependent walk in the light is to let us flounder in the darkness of self. The Lord Jesus also patiently waits to show us that all our sins have been cleansed by his blood. Coupled with our sins is the crushing weight of an evil conscience, which is often endured for years. And he continues to wait for us to acknowledge our position in him in the light so that we may rest in what he has already done about our sins. Let us draw near with a sincere heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. Hebrews 10, 22. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Hebrews 9.14 Labouring under a load of unconfessed sins, we're disqualified from fellowship with the Father as well as from usefulness to others. We are rather a burden to all. It is such believers whom he urges to come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews 4, 16. The need is ever present. The work is forever done. He has placed us in his Son, 
having made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2 verse 6. All that is required is that we confidently abide where we have already been placed. We're not to abide in our present condition, counting on help from him in heaven for our walk and our service. Just the opposite. He has shown us our position in order that we may abide in our risen Lord in the light and presence of the Father. It is from that vantage point that we become involved in the needs of this world. In John 3, 13, our Lord Jesus referred to himself as he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. He shared heavenly life in a world of need. If he is to do the same and more today through us, we must abide in heaven as we sojourn on earth. Only life lived in the light of glory can overcome the world of darkness. In summary then, first we count ourselves to have died to sin and to be alive to God in the Lord Jesus, Romans 6, 11. Secondly, we accept our position in the light when we know ourselves to be new creations in our risen Saviour, Ephesians 2, 6. Thirdly, we enjoy his blessed fellowship as we judge ourselves in confession of our sins, 1 John 1, verses 7 and 9. Then it is that our Lord can work through us in the lives of others, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Acts 26, verse 18. Keep looking down, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Colossians 3, verse 3.